am The Animist, and you are watching the Video Company Podcast, a podcast where we talk about filmmaking and running a video production business. Today we have Mike Rita, who is the director at Apple Box Cinema. Apple Box Cinema is a company that I have been following forever, and they have been a huge influence and inspiration in my filmmaking. Mike and I had a conversation that truly was the thesis of what this podcast is about. Their work is prolific, and it was really great having Mike on the show. So without further ado, here is Mike Rita. If for someone who doesn't know who you are, sure. you could just give like, basically tell a little bit about like who you are and where you're at now mm-hmm. in your career and how you were able to get to that point. Sure. Uh, yeah. Hi. So my name is Mike Rita. I am a uh, director. I own and direct at Apple Box Cinema. Um, I went to film school. I was there um, 2011, 12, 13, something like that. Um, Graduated and uh, almost immediately got a job at a marketing agency doing video production, um, local kind of up near North Lake. And I was there for a couple years and uh, m- made a few changes. And then around 2016, towards the end of 2016, I was like, you know what? I feel like I feel like I can do this. Probably naively, I thought I could do this. This is easy. Uh, so I started Apple Box Cinema, and that was uh, February 2017 was when we started. And uh, so now we are closing in on almost three years. Three years. And so how? what have those three years been like? Was it like as easy of a start as you thought it was? Um, it was as hard of a start as you can imagine. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it basically started as uh, with myself and uh, my buddy Derek, who was my cinematographer. Um, we had we went to film school together. We freelanced on a bunch of projects together. He's usually my DP when we um, make narrative uh, films and stuff like that. And um, I was just like, do you want to try to freelance stuff but uh maybe do it a little bit more professional than just like oh it's just mike and derek right like maybe we can have a a a company name and a little website that has our demo reel on it and that's kind of how it started um and then we uh you know we made a little logo and made a little website and then it kind of kept getting bigger and bigger and then we were like we should just do this so I, i quit my job um we invested um in some gear that we the company could own and um and the first couple gigs were just friends. Like uh, it was a friend that uh, her husband um, was like one of the owners of a local restaurant. And it was like, can we just come film some commercials for you? Like they didn't end up going anywhere. It was just really just for our reel. And so the first couple months was just that. And then uh, eventually we started getting just through word of mouth, actually, um, a couple actual paying clients. Was it by any chance Moo and Brew? It was exactly Moo and Brew, okay. yes. All right. That yeah. was like one of the first things I saw from you yeah. guys. Yeah, I mean, it was a great opportunity. They kind of just let us come in on Saturday morning before they opened and uh, said, do whatever you want, which is awesome. This just usually doesn't happen. Um, but, of course, they weren't paying anything, so and it wasn't going anywhere. So, yeah, you could do whatever you wanted. Um, but, yeah, we, we still use that footage on our reel because like, we, we love the way it came out. So Yeah, it looks great. Um, and then, yeah, so over the next two years, we you know got a couple more pieces of gear and um, – kind of kept building up our kit and building up, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do uh, that was different from the other freelance jobs that we had or the marketing jobs that I had was we wanted to sort of be able to choose who our clients were because we have a vision of like where we want to be. You know, we, our ultimate goal is to be making feature films, narrative films. Um, And there is sort of a progression there. You kind of start with the freelance stuff. You start with the music videos and then you progress to, uh, you know, commercials or something like that. And then, you know, it, once you've built that reel, um, you know, maybe the next step is, is narrative stuff. Um, so we were choosing clients that we hoped could give us some actually like really good commercially looking footage. Um, but like any freelancer knows, um, you also just had to pay your bills. And so we were also doing a lot of the stuff that we didn't like to do from the other uh, freelance gigs that we had. Um, and it was there was a fair amount of, like, eye rolling and, like, oh, boy, we got to do another one of these. But those are the things that keep the lights on and that pay for the gear that we're using and stuff like that. So Everybody has to deal with that. Some people put it different ways. And I was curious. Um, it was something I was going to ask you later on. Uh, but do you... Are you, are you still at that point where you still have to do stuff like that, the company at least? Yeah, I, I mean, there we're not at a point where, um, you know, we're just making money hand over fist where our, we're all salaried employees and, you know, even if this month is slow, we're all getting paid. I mean, it still is like we get paid project by project. So um, 
if we're having a slow month, uh, we kind of take what we can get. Um, I did try to make it clear um, from the beginning with Derek and then with Ashley when we when Ashley came aboard as our producer that like since we're in this phase right now where we aren't you know just we don't just get a weekly paycheck no matter what. Um, I want you guys to feel free to take other roles, take other projects. Like Derek, if you want to DP something for another director or whatever, um, if it doesn't conflict with their schedule, go for it. And same thing with Ashley. If you want to produce something for another um, film crew, by all means. Um, so I think they've done that. They, because we have, it's just the nature of the business is that there are going to be slow months. And so we have had plenty of slow months where, uh, you know, it's, it's scary um, as a full-time freelancer. Um, and I encourage them to try to continue to get gigs wherever they can. Right, but I was thinking more or less about like the um, the kind of eye roll type jobs, mm-hmm. like the ones that are just like, eh, it's like it's just kind of yeah, oh yeah. You, so you still have mm-hmm. a lot of that. I yeah. consider that like bread and butter. It's like, mm-hmm. it, but not in the sense of like, oh, this is like kind of like how we make a living. But mm-hmm. it's like it's like it's how you eat at yeah. least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. I mean, they're not hard. Um, they're usually pretty quick shoots and pretty quick turnarounds and it's not super creative um it's almost kind of formulaic um and it's not the most creatively uh rewarding gigs you know but everyone they are the bread and butter they're the things that help you eat and um and it's not that they're bad it's just that you know when you are a creative person and you want to try to (laughs) step outside the box or do something different um and, you know, the client doesn't allow for that because they're sort of, it kind of needs to just be this. It needs to be this pretty little package. Um, it gets, it just gets frustrating and kind of, you know, tiresome. But yeah, we still do them all the time. So like what would be like certain types of projects? Like what, what type of projects do you guys like always want? Or at least like the type of projects that you get that like when you get them, you're like, yes, finally. We did a project that paid al- almost nothing. Um, but they they pitched the sort of story idea that they had. It was for a product that we r- really believed in. Um, we thought it, and we thought that like the, the video we made could actually like reach some people and, and be uh, effective and emotional engaging and stuff like that. And so, yeah, we worked on it for like a week and did bar- like I said, barely got any pay. I mean, you know, n- nothing basically. Um, but like, it was so refreshing because they, just trusted us they were like we've seen what you can do um here's our idea take it and run with it and then we you know we spent a couple days storyboarding it and got it cast and um shot it in like an afternoon and then um and i'm just like so proud of that piece and it was just it was so fulfilling to work on and it was so great working with people who who kind of respected us and, and trusted us and to be creative you know and do you think they would have been any happier if they had had the uh, idea or like do you think the fact that like they they hired you because it was you Mm -hmm. they knew that like these people have kind of like a thing and if they're able to do it i'm going to be happy like were they do you think they got to that point they they i mean they were with us when we were shooting so like they were they had say on set and we shared ideas and 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 there was a lot of collaboration there um they were super happy super thrilled with the piece um they were um, very complimentary. And I think that, excuse me. Um, I think they, I I don't know how they would have done it any differently. Like, and and not saying like, Oh, we did it so great that they couldn't have changed it. But like they were with us on set and they saw every step of the process and they were just like, yeah, you guys are doing great. Like we would set up a shot and they would just be like, "I I couldn't have imagined it being better than this like yeah. this is this is way better than we expected you would even do um and that just makes you feel good you know it makes you feel good when you're when you're like i i think i know how to, i think i know how to tell this story and then you do it and then the people that it's for are like yeah that was perfect i think like you couldn't have had a better answer because i've noticed <clears throat> i've enjoyed the jobs more like even if even if like it might not be the best video or mm-hmm. best commercial that i've made but when someone comes to me and they're like I have like a base idea, but I want you to kind of do everything else because I trust you and I know you're going to do a good job. Yeah. I have the most fun. Yeah. And like, usually I get to do something that's awesome in some way. Like, you know, I am who I am. Like part, some, something's going to go wrong somewhere and you're going to have to like, uh, you know, kind of just put everything together. Sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, whenever I hear that, it's always like a good feeling because yeah. it's like, this is going to be a good project. Yep. Yeah. We love, we love it when that happens. 
Um, now, it, like, is there a certain type of like industry or anything like that that like you guys want to focus in? I don't know. I mean, we do we do like uh, music videos, especially when again the artist is sort of like I've got an idea, um, but I want you guys to to make it special, right? Um, I've I've I love music. I mean, you know, it's music. It's awesome. And yeah. so if if it's a, an artist that we like and the and it's a style of music that we like and it's a song that we like. Um, I don't think there's a particular industry because I kind of feel like whichever industry it is, there's a story there somewhere. And um, such a pretentious answer. <laughs> there's a story there. And that's that's what we l- like to do is we like to just tell that story. And it's just figuring out the right way to do it. Like my first um, video job was at a marketing agency and we did a lot of stuff with cars. I don't know anything about cars. I, I'm not in that demographic. I don't know how fast they get. None of that stuff matters to me. But I got hired because of I could tell a story. And some of the best some of the best work that I've done in the past several years is like with these brands that, you know, make car parts. <laughs> and it's because we just found out what that story was. Yeah. I did notice that in your reel there was a lot of uh motor sport yeah. type stuff. Yeah. And I was like I didn't. I wasn't aware of this. Yeah, that was the the mark, first marketing agency I worked for. Um, most of their clients were motorsports related, and so for a couple of years it was you know a lot of traveling around the country with fast cars, and I, I felt bad because it was all just wasted on me because I just I yeah. There's know. some people that just eat <laughs> it up. Yeah, I just didn't care. Um, I kind of feel embarrassed when I like I like a I don't know a ton about cars. Yeah. I know enough to get me by, and then two, it's like I just kind of don't care. Yeah, and and like some people are just like, Whoa. yeah. I mean, almost, I was the I was the odd man out. Everyone else that worked there, we like loved them, and they knew all about the horsepowers and the torque and stuff like that. And I was yeah. just like, I don't know what any of this is. Well, so um, I want to touch one thing on Applebox, and then I wanted to kind of go into like <clears throat> actually a bit of your past. Sure. Is uh, I saw that, and this might have been a year ago, might have been two. That y'all did like a music video contest, like giveaway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was curious. I was like, was that more or less to kind of jumpstart doing more music videos? <laughs> Yeah, that that was pretty much exactly what it was, is that we said, because I think, I I hope most small business, I hope we're not too new, unique to m- what most small businesses are like, is that, you know, we've got downtime, um, slow months where uh, you kind of feel like, are we doing this right? Or is there something we should be changing? Are we happy with what we're doing? Should we mix things up a little bit? And we thought it would be kind of cool to do some more music videos and and videos that weren't just like, performance space where they're just you know singing or performing to the mm-hmm. camera um those are fine those are and they're fun to do and they're easy and they're quick but more you know a, a concept or a theme or a story or something like that yeah and so um we just said well let's, let's do a contest because we only know so many musicians and bands and we've already done music videos for them so uh who else can we work with and so we we posted a contest we posted it on instagram and facebook and tagged people and basically just said like if you think you're you, you would like this free free music video um then i i forgot what it was it was like just dms your your details your band or artist name uh and your contact info and we drew one out of a hat and um it was awesome it was a fun experience and uh it, it didn't it didn't lead to more music videos simply because we're such a small team and when when things get going um it just kind of pushes everything else down the line um so we got working on a couple other projects and we just didn't focus on actively trying to get more music videos um but yeah it was it was a it was so much fun and we did meet a lot more musicians and we got contact information from a lot more musicians and a lot of people expressed interest in i would love to do this now they probably won't get one for free um right. but you know, if they if they're interested, then I'd love to continue making those. It's interesting that um, because I've kind of fall into, you know, like half of what I do is corporate slash commercial. Sure. It depends on like what where where you see that divide. Mm-hmm. When is it corporate? When is it commercial? And the other half is music videos. So it's like that's my experience. And that's the way I would see it for a lot of people. But the more I'm talking to a lot of these film- filmmakers in the areas you either do music videos or you do corporate Mm -hmm. and it might be like an 80, 20 thing. Sure. Um, where it's like, it's hard for them to like jump over to the other side. And, um, Andrew made a good point that, you know, every music video has essentially already been done. Sure. And from a director's standpoint, I could definitely see that not being super fun, but like from a DP standpoint, Mm -hmm. it's like you have the most 
you have the most amount of looks that you can be do differently. Yeah, absolutely. Like literally, they're limitless looks. Yep. Um, so I I thought that was interesting because I I had seen like a lot of, not a lot of, but what I had seen of like music videos from you guys, mm-hmm. I was like, I want to see more of that. But I remember not seeing too much. The last thing I think yeah. was like a was it some kind of like classical performance, like a cello in a dark room, something like that. Maybe not a cello. It was like a classical remember. string instrument. Uh, I, I don't, thought that. I don't. I don't remember. Maybe I'm just. Maybe it's just been a while. I never saw in in, com, in product. <clears> I just saw a frame. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. We did a we did a um, a live session with a uh, band in uh, Winston Salem. And God, this was a while ago. This was uh, this was over a year ago. And um, we f- we filmed like three of their songs, and mm-hmm. we just grabbed some some still frames. We gave them all the footage, and they're just they're rolling them out as they continue to. Gotcha. Um, so that one just hasn't been rolled out yet. Oh, gotcha. Because yeah. I remember seeing those frames, and it was like one of those things where when I saw it, I had never really like seen. It was around the time that like I was getting really into like lighting specifics mm-hmm. and stuff like that, and um, I just remember that that frame like really like kind of like changing my path on like where mm-hmm. I wanted to go lighting wise. Yeah, that and I, I remember that we because we shot during the day in just this kind of small house in winston-salem like the living room of this house with a full band and they played live and we did take after take after take um and thankfully they're a good band so it was fun to listen to that stuff over and over again but the first two videos we shot in just in daylight because it was a lot of windows and stuff like that and then i think the last song that we did we it wasn't night yet so i think we must have blacked out all the windows and it was literally just a quasar tube above their head and we'd go from uh band member to band member put the quasar tube kind of dim it to the to the brightness that he wanted and and that was it like so just darkness and then just you know their face and their instrument was lit mm-hmm. up and that's just one of those things that you know Derek is he's so talented that like I don't think I would have gotten it to look that good and he did it with one light you know yeah because uh, anytime I like try to do stuff like that it's like all right I'm gonna flag this mm-hmm. I'm gonna put this over here and then I'm gonna like bounce it's like no yeah just it's one thing dude <laughs> yeah 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 um so the thing on the past that I wanted to talk about is so Andrew actually the reason I'm bringing him up is because you guys are associated y'all yeah. have known each other for mm-hmm. a long time and so this is the first association kind of I've brought onto the show but he said something that I thought was really interesting and I'm always going to find a deeper backstory than there actually is in things sure but about the Sh- Charlotte Art Institute yeah the Art right. Institute Charlotte yeah so yeah. y'all that's where mm-hmm. y'all went to school and there's a bit of an alumni and I think it's just me um having a small business aka for the first year you're probably like at home on your phone a lot yep. um on instagram and like all these people that he named off i'm like i know all those people yeah. i mean not personally but like i know yeah, all yeah. their work and that's like they were all alumni essentially mm-hmm. um so i wanted to kind of like rehash that with you but um so like who are some of the people that you went to school with including andrew that like are s- still in the industry or at least like they don't have to be local because i know sure. Kiefer Andrew actually is <clears throat> yeah, in he, California. He out, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There are a handful of people. Kelvin Edwards is a DP that um, is he just gets better and better with every project. He he shot two of my um, forty eight hour film festival entries last year. Um, Kelvin Edwards, uh, AJ Bartlett, he's moved as well. I'm not sure where he lives, but he was uh, he's he's one of those guys that just has this like like. I I can film something and it might look pretty and be very professional, but he films it in such a way that's just like, it's just so artful. And it's such a it's not probably a great way to explain it, but just like he's just got an artistic eye that um, that I love. Um, yeah, you put me on the spot here. <laughs> I'm trying to remember who who I've worked with in the past. Well, he said I think he said William Brooks was there. Yeah, too. Will Brooks. Um, I I don't think Will Brooks and I had any crossover um, when we were at school because it's a staggered, you know, uh, shortened program. It's not like that's a what I thought degree. it was going to be yeah. like. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that we had any classes together, but we were definitely there at the same time. Uh, Nicole Driscoll. Um, she all she finished before um, before I was there. Um, Christian Simpson. Christian Simpson was one of the first um, DPs that I saw because I remember when I was thinking about going to the Art Institute, um, I went to one of their portfolio shows or something like that, and I was watching just demo reels. Basically, like at the end of the semester, you submit something for the portfolio show, whether it's a film that you've worked on or just your demo reel. And I watched this demo reel, and I was like, "Oh my god, that's so good! Like that's a movie." And yeah. I was like, "Oh, uh, you can do that in Charlotte? Like I thought you had to be in Hollywood to do that kind of stuff." Um, 
and he went on to do some some fantastic some music videos that have you know, hundreds of thousands of views. Um, he works he works a full time gig now at uh, like the sports network or something like that, like Fox Sports or something. Okay. Um, but he uh, he and um, his brother in law Dustin, um, who did not go to the Art Institute, they um, have a production company called Down Home Films, and uh, I don't think they are like actively pursuing gigs, but they did a short film. Um, like two, like a year or two ago, um, about a guy who like sets fire to stuff. It was really, really good. It looked beautiful, really, very moody. Um, yeah, they do some really great stuff. And he also said that the the program is no longer there. Yeah, but um, that like it was just crazy that like the names out of the names, including you, Derek, and mm-hmm. um, I only know of Kiefer Andrew through <laughs> a PA that hung out with him a lot. Um, but, like, I just, you know, it was yeah. one of those people that I ended up following a lot. Um, but I just thought it was crazy that, like, so many came out of um, that yeah. one area. Yeah, there was a pretty big crop, uh, or like I said, around um, 2012, 2013, of, like, seriously talented filmmakers and, and cinematographers that came out of that one school, which is pretty wild. Because it's not a great school. Um it doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, yeah, but it, we, we got lucky. And, and not only like are these guys doing guys and girls doing like great stuff um they are they want to help you on your projects too like andrew and i andrew's been on all of my films and i've been on just about all of his he makes a lot more than i do um but like they're just they're constant collaborators and they're they're so helpful to have on your side because i share my work with them and they share their work with me and we give each other like legitimate feedback right like you show stuff to your family and friends and they're like it's so good but like you show it to like filmmakers and they'll actually tell you what's wrong with it which is what you need you know? yeah it's there's a line that's been stuck in my head recently and i'm like i'm just now getting over it even though i just now realized it was a thing <laughs> but i remember when i was a like teenager whether it was filmmaking or like a like a special effect i learned or like even if it was just like drawing because i used to be mm-hmm. like college level art like when i was really young um is I, I miss people saying like, oh, you did this? Like, yeah. wow, like I didn't yeah. know that you could do this. And then it's like you kind of get good at something, not to like float myself up, but yeah, like yeah. you get good <clears> enough <throat> at something where everybody's like, well, yeah, of course you made it. You're good. You're great. And yeah. I'm like, I, m- I miss it though. Like, <laughs> But so it's just that's weird. Um, it's a weird thing. I always uh, – so when I was um, – when I was in like high school, I played music, I sang, and I played guitar and stuff like that. And um, I would record on my computer just you know music that I liked or popular music of the time or whatever. And uh, I would play it for like my parents or my sisters or whatever, and they would be like, "Oh, it's so good." And to me, it was always like, I don't know, it's not, it's not, it's fine, but it's not right. You know, there's always something wrong with it. And I just remember distinctly my dad saying, um, "No one's gonna notice that. Like, you're the only person that's gonna notice that." And you know, I love him because he's like the most supportive dad ever, but that kind of always rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, well, I'm not making it for the people who aren't going to notice that, right? Like, I I want to put all of my blood, sweat, and tears into this for the people who will notice how hard I worked on that. Right. And when my peers have that reaction, when they're like, dude, this is good. Like, this, you did a great, great job here. Like, that's so, so rewarding, you know? I love it when an audience loves what I do or a client loves what I do. Um but when the people who could pick it apart are are impressed by it, like that's that's the true sign of like success to me. Yeah, exactly. What what could you say about the climate of because this show is specific Charlotte ish? Yeah. I've um, kind of like branched the South Carolina branch with a guest, and I'm hoping to kind of like get into Atlanta because mm-hmm. um, I've been working out there a little more. Yeah, and. But how would you say about, like, let's just say this general, like, Western Carolina, South Carolina area, what would you say is, like, the climate with production companies, whether that's, like, yours or what you've seen with, like, associates? Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of people are, like, saying different things. You know, I hear some people say, like, just what, what's your opinion? We, we've we had a hard time um, figuring out where we sit in the marketplace of production companies, right? Um, we love to do music videos, but those performance-based music videos usually don't pay much, and it's certainly not enough to feed three adults, right? Um, keep our lights on at home. Uh, and everybody's got a 
got a DSLR or a mirrorless camera and a nice lens and a gimbal. Like it's, it's, it, I, I've got a YouTube channel and I, I talked about one of the, you know, new gimbals and I was like, it's, it, it's like the best time to be a filmmaker because equipment is, is cheap, it's better and cheaper than ever, but it's also the worst time because equipment is better and cheaper than ever. Everybody has it, right? Yeah. So it becomes less about what gear you have and more about how you can tell that story. Um, but you also have to, uh, you gotta, uh, like I said, you got to figure out where you sit in the marketplace. And so we, one of the things that we try to tell ourselves is to know our worth. Um, it's okay to negotiate prices, right? We've got, we've got set rates for X, Y, and Z. Um, here's how much this is going to cost based on how much pre-pro time we think it's going to be, how much post-production is going to be. Um, and clients usually say, well, that's way too much. <laughs> so, uh, so we can come down to a certain extent. Again, we, we, we want to make sure that we know our worth. We don't want to be taking projects um, that are, you know, pennies because we just have to. Because what that does is uh, it increases the amount of work that we're doing that we're not going to be happy with. And it messes up with your mental health, right? If you're constantly doing work that you're not happy with, um, you're going to you're going to suffer your, your, like I said, your mental health is going to suffer. Um, and so, and you're going to get behind and you're going to have projects that you're just, that are just sitting on your premiere timeline that you're just like, ugh, I do not want to edit this thing. Um, so we, we try to know our worth. We try to charge accordingly. We try to find clients that can pay for that. Um, but that's hard to do. Um, you know, like I said earlier, Caravan usually has pretty somewhat decent budgets, um, they also have a bunch of good producers and salesmen who know what they're doing and they know how to pitch that stuff. And they know that, you know, we're not even going to talk to clients on in this end of the spectrum because they, we know they're not going to be able to pay for it. So we only talk to these clients that have, have bigger budgets. Um, so it, it, this is a really long <laughs> rambling way to get to, around to answering your question, but like the, there are, the, the marketplace of uh, film production companies in Charlotte is kind of dependent on the uh, level of, uh, of work that you want to do and the, the, the price range, to be honest. Like, there aren't a lot of companies doing caravan-level work at caravan-level budgets. Um, there are some, and, and there are some uh, companies that can do really good stuff for way less, right? Um, and there's... A bunch of there's, but there are a ton of people who are like, yeah, I'll shoot that video for two hundred bucks, uh, you know, I'll, and I'll come out with my my uh, Ronin M and my you know A7 III or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and that that makes it hard as a small business, as I'm sure you know, is you know when a client is like, well, but this guy says he'll do it for half as much, and he's got basically the same equipment as you have, so then how do you how do you explain to them that it's not just the gear, it's the person behind the gear, it's the creative vision, it's the story that you're going to be telling, it's the, you know, you're not just getting a video, you're getting you're getting a product that is part of your brand, whether you're a musician or a company or whatever. Um, you know, you spend thousands of dollars on a logo and a website and whatever. If this video is going to represent you, you should treat it the same way, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, some some clients are receptive to that, and some aren't. You know, I, I've <clears throat> there's like two philosophies that I've both heard of that fall in line with like what to do there, and that's some people say, oh, we've got to educate your client yeah. sometimes, which is what you said, and then um, I don't know if you're familiar with Gary V, but like, mm -hmm. and I might be taking this slightly out of context, but I feel like it kind of works. Is he would say like, I try not to sell the unsellable, sure. which that client yeah. doesn't sound like the unsellable, <clears throat> but. And I've uh, I've also learned like uh, pay attention to every red flag. Mm -hmm. That's just yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So it's like as soon as I hear something like oh, but they can do it, and then like mm -hmm. I see who it is, I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm like okay, yeah, that's fine. But the but that's the scariest part about a small business or f f full time freelancing or whatever you want to call yeah. it is the you know I, I I've watched plenty of those Facebook seminars where it's like I'm going to show you how to make twice as much money you're going to make a hundred thousand yeah. dollars per year right I've watched all of those seminars and it's like step one double what you're charging you're going to lose a lot of clients but they're not the clients you want anyway it's like well uh, yeah that 
makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to work on these small budget things. Um, so I'm going to charge twice as much, but then it's like, <laughs> but, but what if no one, what if no one can pay this? Yeah. Then, so it's, you know, that's the struggle that we've had in the past three years is figuring out, figuring out, you know, what is reasonable, um, but that is still fair to us for the amount of time and work that we, like I said, I, I don't think in the three years that I, cause I mostly, uh, Derek and I kind of share editing capabilities. Um, recently we've been bringing on just a freelance editor for certain projects. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I don't think I've ever been paid for post production because usually our negotiations are like, you know, here's how much it costs, and they're like, well, I can't pay that much, and I'm like, fine, I'll edit this for free, because we want that gig, so I'll take this, you know, this chunk of uh, a payment out. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so it's tough. It's it's hard to, especially with like some people that like I have clients from when I first started out that I still work with like monthly, mm-hmm. minimum, yeah, sure. quarterly, and um, you know, it's like it's hard to. Everybody else, they're like, I guess I've never like publicly announced it. Not that, you know, <laughs> this is publicly announcing. But um, it's like I have some people that are grandfathered. Mm-hmm. And it's like I'm going to respect that. Yeah, absolutely. But um, and it just hurts because it's like, you know, they I don't get paid for a lot of what mm-hmm. I do for them. But it's like I wouldn't be here without them. Right. right. So it's kind of hard. So like I. I do completely understand with like feeling like you're in the negative when it comes to editing and stuff like that. It's tricky too, because even if you have a client that maybe isn't necessarily grandfathered, but they're they're you've negotiated a lower rate, right? You're taking a little bit of a hit. Yeah. One way or another. Some of them are in contract. It's like, I literally have like, can't do anything. Sure. Yeah. But even if you've got, even if you got something like that, where you're taking a little bit of a hit, um, in most businesses, in industries, um, just the cost of doing business goes up every year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we bought some new gear, or maybe we are hiring another, you know, part-time editor or something like that. But like, you know, we've had clients. We, we have certain clients that we've had for almost three years now, and when we just have to charge more for whatever reason, even if it is just like, well, we weren't getting paid for editing or whatever before. Now we kind of need to be doing that. It's. Uh, Clients, they don't like that. They don't like it when you do that. No. But it's, but y- y- you kind of want to just say like, but don't you do that? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You do that to your clients, right? So yeah, it's a little crazy. But that's you know that's I think the the biggest struggle that Apple Box has has had is me not knowing how to do business, right? I've never taken a business class. I don't know anything about sales or B two B or anything like that. Those are all just buzzwords that I've heard before. Um, I know I know how to make videos and so it's like I kind of just want to do that and you know that's what I was saying about mental health is that like you need to make time for yourself mm-hmm. um, I wasn't doing that for a while and I started getting like kind of borderline panic attacks because I would see my inbox with like you know 20 unread emails and I was and I would just be like I don't know what to do here and so you kind of have to you, you really do need to to take care of yourself and and drop dead weight when it's not helping you. Like if yeah. you've got a client that is always stressing you out, see, go elsewhere. You know what I mean? Now was the, um, 20 unread emails, was that dead weight or was some of that just like being busy? Um, it kind of half and half. And okay. so the uh, dead weight's m- maybe not the right way to put it, but like, you know, version, version six, revision nine, where yeah. it's like, w- now it's the same video as it was on version two, mm-hmm. right? Like, uh, and, and, and again, as a non-business person, um, a normal business person would say, get a contract, have them sign a contract and you only get this many revisions and you only get that. Um, one of the, one of the biggest helps to me and apple box was when we hired ashley as our producer um and because i just keep getting in my own way with that negotiating with by saying by saying um fine you know we'll do it oh oh this this is too much then whatever you want to pay is fine right like that's we're never gonna survive if we keep doing that and i'm just gonna keep getting more and more anxious and you know antsy and nervous um and so when she came along and started kind of took over that part of it where saying like i'm gonna come up with quotes tell me what we charge for x y and z i'm gonna come up with quotes i'll negotiate but she's she's removed enough from the actual physical production that like i don't have to worry about that side of it and i don't have to worry because like when i'm on set or on location or whatever with a client 
I don't want to talk about money stuff because it makes kind of everyone uncomfortable, right? And I want when we're shooting something, I want for whoever is representing that brand to, to be in a good mood and to mm-hmm. think that, hey, they're doing a great job and I'm, I really like working with them. It's a lot of fun and they're yeah. very professional. But then if I'm like, so you didn't pay and I can't really start editing this until you pay, like that's so uncomfortable for me yeah. and it's uncomfortable for them. So I don't think anybody's going to enjoy that. Yeah, nobody enjoys that. So having uh, you know a producer, having Ashley uh, kind of step in and take care of that stuff um, was a huge weight off of our shoulders because the more stuff that you have to do that isn't your job, you're you're being taken away from what your job is, right? When you're on set and you're directing something and you also have to <laughs> hold the boom pole or you also have to set this light up and grip and gaff and all do all this other stuff. It's like, well, now I'm not directing. I'm just putting out all these other fires. Like, mm-hmm. I just want to be able to focus on my job, you know? Well, and so I actually had a question, uh, having a producer, how has it changed the business? Um, because... When I'm getting to the point now where it's like, that's the absolute move. Like, yeah. if I could hire anyone, it wouldn't be a grip. It yeah. wouldn't be an editor. It would be like, just can you handle some of those things? Yeah. So I can, like, it's hard enough um, shooting and directing because I, and like I said in a previous episode, it's like, I have to direct out of necessity. Sure. I tend to be good at it. I happen to be good at it. But it's like, I only do it out of necessity because yeah. uh not going to trust yeah, yeah, someone absolutely. else's idea that um like the client mm-hmm. i mean sometimes the client has a good idea and sometimes they know exactly what they want but when they're like i want something like really off the wall and creative it's like i kind of come through sure yeah but um like the the real move was like getting a producer mm-hmm. um and i think like i'm just really curious like you kind of answered the mm-hmm. question how it changed but like maybe if you could go a little more in depth as to like does she handle like booking of like locations mm-hmm. and like all like literally all that stuff? So yeah. you can just rely on you can just do your creative part. Yeah, I mean it, it is it is one of those things that like I would not have thought that the next person to hire should be a producer, um, but it absolutely should. Um, <clears throat> the more producers you can have, the better, I think. Um, yeah, it basically went from me um, uh, reaching out to clients to get new new clients. Um, interacting with clients about what they wanted, what their vision was, what the story was, whatever, um, coming up with the quote, coming up with the, the video concept, uh, planning the shoot, scheduling the shoot, um, figuring out what if we needed to rent any equipment or whatever, figuring out if Derek needed any help with grips or ACs or whatever, then going to the shoot and directing and and managing the clients that were there on set and telling them that like, well, it looks really flat right now, but we're gonna color grade it afterwards, explaining them what all that stuff is, uh, and then bringing it back and answering any emails that I got while I was gone, and then editing it and, you know, and then getting feedback. So it went from me doing all of that to basically Ashley saying, Here's when the shoot is. Uh, here's when you need to be there. Here's what they're looking for. We st- what we what we do at the beginning of a project is we come up with uh, we call it Project Doc. Very creative title. Um, it's just a Google um, Google Doc, and we we list what the client is, what the objective of the video is, who the audience is, all that kind of stuff. We put visual inspiration in there, um, s- temporary schedule until we can like iron out all details, um, and then we share that with client, get their feedback, and it's kind of like a production bible for each shoot um, before we go. So like I'm still involved in that, um, and she'll usually get that set up. Um, but then yeah, it is just like you know. Take, take the production Bible. Um, here's when, here's where you're going. Here's what you're shooting. Um, we bring it back. She, she's been dealing with all the clients, all the feedback and stuff like that. She just relays that to us. Um, it has been fantastic. Now, one thing that I know we aren't doing properly, um, is, is things like accounting and finances and stuff like that. We are, um, we're not business people, (laughs) so we don't know how to do that stuff. Um, but she is handling that now. And I think the other, the other big thing is, like I said, I got out of my own way is that, she will say, uh, here, you know, this client reached out. This is what they're looking for. Um, here's what the first kind of quote is. Here's what I think we're going to charge. And it's usually like a range. You know, it's if it's if we think we're going to spend four to six hours on pre-pro or whatever, it's the, kind of that range. Um, what do you think? And I say, well, <laughs> and I always say this is going to be way too much. There's no way they're going to say yes. Um, but she sends it to him anyway. And sometimes it is, and then she negotiates down. But like. 
if it were me, I would just say pay whatever you think is fair, and they're and they will never pay the right amount. Right. Um, so she has gotten actual fair compensation for the last you know six eight months of uh, of projects that we've been working on, um, and it's made things a lot better. Um, of course, you're always going to have clients that are going to try nickel and dime you for everything, yeah. um, and those are always going to be frustrating. But having her um, kind of take that. Uh, take some of those responsibilities that were taking me away from being creative, taking me away from actually working on the, the storytelling uh, was a uh, just, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't praise her enough for that. Well, now there's like one part that like uh, te- theoretically keeps me from wanting to kind of do that same mm-hmm. jump is <clears throat> I'd be worried about just, the communication drops. You you did explain that the Google the mm-hmm. doc, the yeah. um, the production bible, mm-hmm. and I mean that sounds like a great solution yeah. to any kind of communication issues. Sure. But like, do you do you find and this is not a hit against her, but like, sure. do you find that it's easier for things to slip through the cracks? Like, just communication wise, with like maybe the client like had this kind of idea that maybe just wasn't put, or, or mm-hmm, does everything mm-hmm. go into the production Bible? We try to put ev- everything in there. And like I said, we share it with them first. And it's like still frames that we've grabbed from films or from other videos that are similar. We put video links in there and we say, hey, this is a video that we found on YouTube or Vimeo or whatever that is more or less in the same industry as you're in uh, or it's the same type of music that you make or whatever it is. Um, you know, here are the things that we like about that video. Here are the things that we'd like to do differently. Um, so, and we put like the video concept and I've got like a, a, a downloadable template that I can share um, and can be tweaked to whoever wants to use it. Um, but it is super helpful. But like I said, we try to put everything in there. Um, there's always going to be things that slip through the cracks. Ashley is great about um, checking and double checking. Um, so like, and there are times where I'm like, where I want to just say like, yes, it's fine. Just, I trust you. Like, yeah. I trust you completely. You're doing a great job. Go for it. Um, but she wouldn't be doing her job if she did that. So, like, she, things will fall through the cracks just inevitably in anything. Um, but a good producer, um, like I said, checks and double checks and makes sure that, that it's right with you and that it's right with them uh, before, you, before you get too far. And, and after that, it's usually just the client, you know, deciding, deciding afterwards that they want something different. Right. Yeah. Um, when I did want to kind of go into – like sales a little bit i've like been a little gun shy with the past um guests i kind of like might maybe touch on it a little <laughs> bit um with like how people get work like how yeah. they do leads and sales and stuff like that but like you kind of touched up on it already because i mean that's half half of the podcast it's sure yeah, not yeah. like this isn't film riot <laughs> this is like like video but it's yeah. also business um and so you, you kind of have a hard time with sales but like mm-hmm. she definitely helps a lot and you know I didn't, I would say like up until like December, I was terrible at it. Mm-hmm. And just like anything else, it's kind of like, um, I wasn't great at After Effects in 2016. Sure. So I like looked up how to get better sure. at it and now yeah. I'm better. And so like around December, I started researching really hard. Like, how do I like sell better? Mm-hmm. Like, how do I stop being a pushover when it sure. comes to negotiations? Yeah. And I looked it up and I was able to like, I've always been good at like emulating. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, a lot of people, especially people close to me that are good at business, they always like look at us people. Mm -hmm. I don't like to say creative. I don't know why. I just like, there's something about the (laughs) word that seems like it's like a, uh, like a dog whistle in the corporate world or something like that. Um, but that they're like, you know, Oh, the, like the people that are really creative, they have a hard time doing the business part. Mm -hmm. And I've always like, not liked that, but Mm -hmm. at the same time, it's like, it's kind of true. Sure. Like you can, you can always learn a trick, but that doesn't mean that you're necessarily like born to do that. Yeah, or it, or you just might always hate it, right? Like, yeah. I, I'm I'm pretty good at selling our services, right? I can I can schmooze if I have to. I can um, really sell the importance of you know this video is going to connect with your your audience and it's going to create that brand awareness it's going to create that brand advocacy and it goes beyond just a a single product they're going to you know i can i can do that right i can sell what we do um and and our creative vision but when i say here's what it costs and they say that's too much i go 
you're right. It is too much. <laughs> That's where I, you know, were, and, and I know I should know better, right? Mm-hmm. I, I should know better. Uh, I don't know if it's just a crippling fear of like rejection or if it's just the, you know, I've got them, but it costs too much. Now I'm going to lose them. If I, if I just stick to my guns and say, well, I understand it's a, you know, there's a little bit of sticker shock, but here's what you're going to get out of it. Um, I just can't, I'm just so bad at that. Um, and that's where, you know, a good producer comes in or someone who, who isn't just like, doesn't have just a crippling fear of that, uh, can just say, I'm sorry, but that's, you know, that's what it costs. And and here's why. I mean, we tried to also, man, we've, we've, we've done so many different approaches. We've done the, the package approach, right? Here's four buckets and here's the, you know, the baby bear and here's the mama bear and here's the papa bear. Mm -hmm. Um, and here's what you get out of it. And that didn't seem to really work or it worked, but it wasn't fair to us, you know, in our time. Um, and we kind of settled on more or less day rates. Um, and we charge for the full day, even if it's only like a three or four hour shoot, because we probably won't be doing two shoots in one day. So if you book us, then you've got us for the day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, those numbers always scare me because it just seems like, it, but I know that that's what it's worth. I know that like my time and my education and my skill set and uh, Ashley's time planning all this stuff and the countless hours she's going to spend on the phone with you and emailing you and uh, you know Derek's education and his skill set that like I can't reproduce by myself. Um, that's what this is worth. Uh, so I know I should know better and I should just know. Uh, how to explain that and how to break down. We do in our quotes, we do try to kind of break it down. We do say that like pre-production is, this is what it is. It's the the time you spent emailing and phone calling and planning right. and stuff like that. Production is your 5K video and your whatever. Um, I don't think they really ever look at that. I think they just look at the number at the bottom and yeah. freak out. Yeah, I, I think like, and it's weird kind of when I look at, uh, I'm just assuming that everybody else kind of has this similar thing. Or maybe it's just because I'm a terrible web developer. <laughs> but like, I'll look at the analytics on my website, and it's like, oh, um, this a much amount of time was spent on this site or mm-hmm. like this page, and then it's like this IP address. So I'm only assuming it was maybe this guy that emailed me like a week sure, later. Yeah. And I'm just like, all the, like all this stuff mm-hmm. I wrote, like all the videos, the pictures, like they're not looking at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might have seen like one thing, and then they're like, yes or no. Sure. Yeah. And it's like, I'm fine with like the amount of business that come in, but it's just like nuts. It's like. They're, they don't. They don't yeah. read. They don't pay attention. It's like just. It's really easy yeah. to like kind of switch that. But um. So YouTube, I would like as much as I would love to talk about like the Kine Mini that sure, y'all used yeah. to use. Um, did you ever operate that much? I never operated the okay. Kine Mini. Yeah, okay. I. That was actually one of the. I think that might have been the first time I reached out to you guys because I was like really close to getting one, mm-hmm. and y'all were the only people I know. And yeah. I think it was actually you met, DM'd me this long ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were like talking about the EV and like how uh-huh. like it just was like really grainy all the time. Derek, I just I told Derek that you sent me that message and he responded and I just copied and pasted it. Oh, okay. Because I never because like it was because the 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 Kinneys now are are much nicer and they produce. Yeah. I mean, Philip Bloom's going ham on those Kinneys, yeah. right? And um, they seem a lot easier to use, but his. For whatever reason, the one that Derek had, I was just like, I don't understand this. Like, it it was so uncamera like I couldn't figure out how to use it. Um, the buttons were all weird because there was no touch screen or anything like that. The buttons were strange, and I just couldn't. So I was just like, I'll let you figure this yeah. out. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna just assume. But it's like Derek stuff is a little dark, and I do notice that sometimes, yeah. like with those things, it's like you kind of gotta go to the right and. Mm-hmm turn it back down we do have a dark aesthetic and yeah. it's it, we that's just kind of how we we like shadows a lot and um we I, I don't know i think when i see images that are just like blasted with light it just for some reason feels so artificial to me mm-hmm. um so we kind of embrace shadows and you know it, it usually ends up with a lot of grain but that's just kind of how it goes yes yeah. i matt workman got me into commercial lighting mm-hmm. which, which led to like kind of like discovering deacons really late sure but it's just like i don't know there's something about like cable like at&t and verizon commercials Mm -hmm. i love it yeah oh yeah but like i'm trying to find a balance of like dark because you know that's what like i I, I think that the culture has caught on late that like dark is like the thing now Mm -hmm. but it's like you 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 know derek and some of the other people around here they've been doing dark for a while but i didn't want to go too far into like technical stuff the youtube channel yeah 
So why did you start it? Mm -hmm. Um, have you seen any growth from it? Like, have you, like, have you enjoyed it? Just tell me why you started it and like how it's been going and like it, the quality is amazing. Thank you. Or have you been filming it? Yeah, I shoot those all by myself. That's yeah. great. Thank you very much. So yeah, I started it. Um, I started it in like, I don't know, January, February or something like that. And, um, I wanted to do it um, for a couple reasons. One, to just kind of have something to post every month, um, some some kind of content. Um, I don't have any kind of like goals or dreams of like getting a huge following and monetizing and you know making selling ads or anything like that. Um, I've always kind of liked teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I and I feel like I've learned so much from YouTube University um, that I'd like to kind of share if I could. Um, it was also in part to educate our clients. Some of our videos have to do with money and how we charge for things. Not necessarily what we charge, but how and why we charge right. for things. So those are things that we, those are videos that we put front and center on our website in case anyone spends any time um, clicking through. Um, some of them are product reviews. Um, we only have a couple hundred followers um, and I haven't posted anything in like a month and a half. Uh, it really, I only make them when I've got time to make them. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a list at home of, uh, the next like five topics that I'm going to cover. Um, it all, it is also hard when you shoot, shoot them by yourselves because like getting B roll of stuff, I can't, I can't film any B roll of myself. Yeah. Uh, getting B roll of stuff can be tough. Um, and, and the really technical stuff I don't know enough about, like Derek, Derek knows the cameras inside and out. I don't really know them that well. I know, um, I know how to shoot a pretty image, but like when it comes down to like bit rates and codecs and stuff like that, that just goes over my head. Um, so I don't want to speak to things that I don't fully understand. Right. Um, I have, I, yeah, I, I love making them. It is a blast to make them. I have a lot of fun. It's not, they're not hard. I shoot them uh, in an afternoon. Uh, I kind of write a script and then I break it into paragraphs that are easily to, easy to remember. Um, and I kind of read it and read it over and then I look up at the camera and then I record it. Um, we the the nice part though is that even though I haven't posted in a month and a half, um, every day I get notifications that I've got a new subscriber. So like in the past month we've got gotten over a hundred more subscribers just because you know the tags are good and the content is pretty decent. Um, so that's that's great to see. It's great to see that the mm -hmm. stuff that we're making is uh, interesting to someone. So I wanna uh, I wanna keep making stuff. Um, I have recently got my hands on the uh, Blackmagic 4K, um, so I'm going to do a video on that and the in the kit and stuff like that. Um, uh, we one of our main go-to lights was that Godox um, yes, SL60, yeah, um, $120 light, which has just been it just fantastic. came down in price, yeah. Did it? Oh, well, it was fantastic. 160, now it's back to 120. Uh, go get them. Go get a couple of them because they're they're so handy to have. Um, but I also get recently got my hands on some, some 120D Mark IIs, which are fantastic, so I'll probably do something on those. Um, most of this stuff has been done by people before. Um, hopefully, I put a interesting spin on it that is entertaining to watch. That's kind of my goal, is that uh, it, it's, it's half educating people um, who want to make videos, half educating our clients on the gear that we use, why we use it, how, you know, wh why it costs so much, um, and then how that can help their video. Yeah. And I mean, th that multi-purpose is really smart. Mm. It sounds like something that someone had told me, um, and I never thought about to, well, yeah, I've never done anything like that, but I think it's really smart. And also like the, the great thing about YouTube is, um, it's kind of like, there's no time frame. Mm -hmm. Like with Instagram, it's like if nothing's happening in the first couple hours, yeah. you're kind of hitting on the clock. And then after like a day or two, it's mm -hmm. like that's done forever. Yeah, for sure. Um, but YouTube, it's like if it hits the right spots, mm -hmm. like it's there forever and it's it it could blow up in six months. And, or and all, they gotta, all they got to do is smash that bell icon. <laughs> yeah. Um, see, I, I've been withholding from – so I started a YouTube channel – I've had a YouTube channel since I was younger, mm -hmm. but I recently started continually doing content, and then um, after that became like, I don't know if I was making it too hard on my mm -hmm. hard for myself, or if I'm just too busy, or just don't know how to like relax anymore. But it was just becoming a little too much, and this was like an easier way. Sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, I, it's it's been hard to do the whole sign off thing and be like, hey, like and subscribe. Like <laughs> yeah. the words like and subscribe have not come out of my mouth like the entire it. time I was doing it. I was like, I, hate it. I don't know. Like, I try to I try to sign off by saying, uh, if you could, you know, please please like our videos and subscribe to the channel, uh, because yeah, uh, click that subscribe button and smash that bell icon. It just makes my skin crawl. <laughs> also, the the whole like uh, acknowledging like hello like what's, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if Peter McKinnon started it, but like I feel like everybody says "What's up, YouTube?" They go "What's up, YouTube?" Uh, yeah, God, it's bad. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you gotta find your you gotta find your intro and your in your outro. Yeah. Uh, it's. I feel like this episode was the best to explain. Like, if there was a tagline <laughs> for the podcast, this this episode finally hit all the marks. I think you were very transparent about the company, and it was interesting, kind of like hearing about it firsthand because like i said like all of doing is i wonder if like some people think especially the guests is like kind of you know a lot mm -hmm. why is that and it's like well you post it all on the internet and i've like paid really close attention to like the film community in charlotte even though like i don't participate in sure. anything yeah so um but yeah it was it's i think this stuff i i'm i'm a big fan of this and i think it's a i think it's a great idea and i think it's i, I don't know i i, I there's there's this fear in um in filmmakers i think specifically uh indie filmmakers that like if that person is doing something good now i can't do something good and it's like well that's not necessarily true like that's another part of the reason why i wanted to make that youtube channel is like just because i have this knowledge or whatever doesn't mean that i can only have it right like you succeeding in your business does not mean that my business will not succeed, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure there is competition. I'm sure when you get to the Nikes and Adidas's of the world, uh, there's you're dealing with numbers and st you know stockholders, shareholders, and stuff like that, where um, you know com competition is crazy. But like, I I I want to see people in the community do well, um, and so the fact that you're interviewing people and asking them, how are you doing what you're doing, and I'm going to learn from what Andrew said. I'm going to learn from what your other guests say. Um, and hopefully they'll learn from something that I said. And I think that, you know, that what is that phrase about the uh, rising sea raises all boats or whatever? It's like if we're if one of us is doing well, we can all do well. Yeah. I've never heard that before. And I butchered that phrase. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is for well, real. It's really interesting. The conversation that I had that actually delayed this entire episode being set up. Um, apologies once again. Is oh, no worries. so um one of my co-working mates we just i had seen him sit across from me for a week now and we never chatted and mm -hmm. it's shocking that like on a friday night in a place that's supposed to be i'm not hating on anybody but like in a place that's like entrepreneurs essentially like yeah. friday five o'clock they're gone yeah and i was like the first week i was here for that i was like what yeah because it's like i generally <laughs> work like six days a week mm -hmm. and try to work like at least 10 hours mm -hmm. and um so it was just shocking, and I ended up talking to this guy, and we kind of hit it off. We just started talking um, about what he did, and then he asked what I did. But then it came into um, how I was talking about uh, a late ph philosophy I've had lately is I really want to get that. You know how they always say, like, to go from good to great? Mm -hmm. It's that just extra 10%. Yeah. It's just that littlest bit. I've become obsessed with that lately, and he asked me, he's like, well, how are you going to do that? And I was like, I mean, I don't necessarily know it'll work mm -hmm. but it i've been doing it for a couple weeks now that this show the youtube thing just kind of like um working here just kind of going out more because i'm such an introvert i just used same. to like literally wake up sit at my desk all day same um and i've been changing that because of people you know people have been pushing me a little bit to like get a little more out there and then as soon as i did it I saw mm -hmm. a result. Sure, of course. And I was like, just keep doing it. Yeah. So um, what I told him is that to, for me to get the extra 10% is me to just, like, give. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Like, this this is, like, yeah, I've got a camera pointed on me, but it's just because it's, like, eventually when I do talk, you know. It, <laughs> right, right. So it's more or less about, like, the guest. I'm learning a ton <clears throat> from the guest, but also it's, like, it's free content for, yeah. for you. Like, and you just, I don't know, just giving. Yeah, I love it's it. I the love the best that. way to kind of like do well. Yep, I agree. I love that philosophy. 
Well, um, that was the end of my rant. Cool. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if, is there anything that you wanted to plug, any kind of like upcoming projects or any kind of like other than YouTube? You can plug the YouTube channel, but any anything? Yeah, no, this? I mean, um, appleboxcinema.co um, is our website. And because uh, we're being real cheeky and uh, it's the cinema company, so .co, right? Uh, and everyone gets it wrong. And, <laughs> and, uh, I, and I've probably missed out on a lot of emails because of that. Um, oh, dude. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> there's nothing cool coming up. We got a film festival next weekend or next week. Um, yeah, nothing cool. Just film festival. Nothing cool. Yeah. So. Um. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. And this yeah. is awesome. Appreciate it.